So consider the following statement. See, we have a flow. Okay, in the paper also. we have like you know segregated it accordingly only like you know complete modern indian history we begin from when we begin from the european penetration okay so 1705 from the death of aurangzeb onwards it becomes our modern indian history okay now so later mughals time alla we still you know consider it to be modern indian history only because you know with the later mughals only we will start seeing the penetration of the europeans okay so with the penetration of europeans it became like full fledged modern indian history okay so these developments are those that accompanied the european penetration in india okay so therefore we start from 1700s onwards so ideally it your your spectrum and all those books no they start from 1857 okay but you know you need context alva for any particular you know topic to be understood you need context so context building happens only if you go a little behind the events okay little backwards towards the you know uh, history okay so james augustus he keep published the first newspaper in india in 1880 okay so okay so now here two complicated things that is one is this year and the other one is first newspaper and the other one is the name okay so these are the facts that we are going to deal in this first statement okay now so have you heard about this any time yes because okay. the first paper is also known as the hiki gazette anta right or not so obviously this is a facts okay that they are giving because we know that first paper is the bengal gazette and it's also known as the hiki gazette so these two things known now we have to wait okay and then hiki press was seized within 2 years owing to sedition is this true yes it is because in 2 years time he will go and the british okay so what is sedition anything that is against the government was considered to be sedition therefore this is also true okay and then the third statement is the newspapers of 18th century primarily aimed at catering to the intellectual entertainment of europeans and anglo indians so this is not a fact this is a little analytical statement okay what does it say it aimed at catering to the intellectual entertainment of europeans and anglo indians so what is this intellectual entertainment all about and of whom of europeans and anglo indians so that means people who are not of indian origin okay so whoever have come here as settle you know as a settler here or as a trader here or as a government servant here okay so for them as well as people of the british origin no they are having an intellectual entertainment through the newspapers so that means what it is actually an analytical you know document that they are getting from the indian masses okay so and at the beginning if you take like you know right from the beginning so not at the you know national uh, freedom struggle times okay but little earlier around 1850 60s or, uh, or like little later okay around like even before like the dire end of 19 uh, 19th century and all this is definitely true okay so the main purpose of the papers were this okay it was actually like a food for thought for them to you know understand the local people as well as the you know uh, the societal setup okay so whether they are liked by the people or disliked by the people how is their administration all those were actually intellectually awakening okay that is why press was very strictly regulated at a later date correct yes so first one is true but now 1880 is that right is my question 1880 by now no think logically when did inc come up 1885 1885 5 so now by the time inc came don't you think inc had a you know very good foundation for it to establish itself and that's why inc came up don't you think papers should have been much before that like it's one century before 1780 okay got it so therefore this statement is wrong though this is true look at the year okay so from 1885 to 1947 we are getting independence so imagine if the newspapers are coming only here in the span of like another 60 or 70 years you wouldn't have got independence like that amount of you know widespread information wouldn't have reached the people okay so if you think little logically this year is false okay though the statement is right okay so that way yes got it 
Moving ahead, Treaty of Tordesillas paved way for the Portuguese incursions into India. 1487, Portuguese navigator Bartholomew Dias sailed to the eastern coast of India. Which of the following statements are correct? So, please make sure that you see what is the demand of the question. Correct or incorrect statements. That's really important. Okay. So, Treaty of Tordesillas. Any idea about this? In our prelims class, we have discussed. Who is the first European who came to India? Which country? Which, which? Portuguese. Right? So, this is related to Portuguese only. Okay, so Treaty of Tordesillas is a treaty between the Portuguese and the Spain in Europe. Okay, na? so they decide whatever is on the east of, you know, the boundary, they would go, that would go to Portuguese, the Indian Ocean. Okay, east of it goes to Portuguese and west of it goes to the Spain. Okay, so therefore with that, you know, term, the Indian Ocean, east of, you know, uh, east of their boundary line actually, okay. So, that goes to our Portuguese and therefore, they try to explore eastwards and Spain tries to explore westwards, okay. So, this is the first thing. Actually, Portuguese and the Spain are, uh, you know, rivals in your home countries, okay. In their home continent, they are rivals, okay. So, to avoid rivalry, they will draw a boundary as to where I will explore, where you will explore. So, this is one treaty that gave Portuguese an hint as to go eastwards and that's how they could come to India. Okay, so that's why they came into India. Okay, and the next one. In 1487, Portuguese navigator Bartholomew Dias sailed to the eastern coast of India. Yes, why not western coast? No, it was like he comes from the Cape of Good Hope from Africa down south. Okay. So, see, actually, Western Coast will be well guarded. Okay. Later, our Vasco da Gama now comes up. Okay. But firstly, it was the Eastern India only, which was, you know, explored by our Europeans. Okay. So, I specifically made sure that this is in your paper because, you know, the very moment you think of Western Coast or Eastern Coast, logically, what you would be thinking? Western Coast only is the first one. So, definitely. But it's not true. The first coast to be explored was our Eastern Coast. Got it? And this is true. See, these years here and there are a little difficult to remember. But then, you know, when there is details like name and this, no? So, years they generally don't play around with. Okay? So, you can go ahead with the statement. Got it? So, that both statements are correct here. Got it? Yes? So, some are very easy to remember. Okay. And uh, 1487 is not something that we can actually remember, but it's still like, you know, like except this, what is the next fact that you will remember? You will remember about 1498 because Vasco da Gama comes in. Okay. So, two people are little important guys. Bathroom it is as well as the Vasco da Gama are little important. Okay. Fine. The first bit of the Indian territory to be under the Europeans since the time of Alexander the Great was. Why? Yeah. So, if you look at the other places, no, Surat or Calcutta or Cochin. So, first people, Europeans to come to India were Portuguese. So, if you look at these, definitely Calcutta, no. Okay. Surat also Portuguese never had any say. So, now Cochin and Goa are the two places which you can think of. But Cochin was more of French settlements. Okay. So, obviously it can be Goa. Okay, so though the question looks very much like, you know, difficult, but if you can connect the dots, I mean, dots as to who came in first, then we can easily figure out that this is to be Goa. Got it? Moving ahead. Arrange the following events in chronological order. So, chronological order questions are a bit, you know, difficult when you do not know the events. Okay, so it's really important that we know the important events at least. Okay, now. So, first one, Queen Elizabeth issues charter rights to merchants of London. Which year is this? This at least is very famous, Alva. Which year is that? Not that far. Like, we, we had uh, Europeans coming to India at the times of Jahangir and uh, Aurangzeb, Captain Hawkins. Have you heard of, of these names? Captain Hawkins, Thomas uh, Rowe, Sir Thomas Rowe. There were people who came, who, who were coming when uh, these uh, Mughals were there. Alva. So, 18, uh, 19th century is very late. 1600. Okay, so this is the first time that our 
East India Company, maybe East India Company is taking shape because our queen accepted, I mean, our uh, England queen accepted for the, you know, for a group of merchants to go eastwards and set up a trading company. Okay, now, yes. So, Bombay had been gifted to King Charles II by the King of Portugal. So, this is a little important because, why this is important? Because after the, you know, British becoming significant in India, okay, after the British uh, of all the Europeans, British becoming significant. They had three prominent presidencies here, which are there. Three prominent presidencies of British. Uh, no, British presidencies. Uh, yeah, not provinces, presidencies and Sakaritala. Madras presidency, Bombay presidency, and Calcutta presidency. Right or not? Three important presidencies they had under their control. Right or not? So now, Despite the British, all that we know about Bombay presidency is what? It was under the British control. Okay, now, but before that, it was completely under the control of Portuguese. Okay, now, Bombay was with Portuguese only. Portuguese gave it as a gift. Okay, one Catherine of Braganza. Okay, so she's a Portugal princess. She will be married to a British king. Therefore, Bombay is given as a gift to British. Okay, it was not captured by them, which eventually became a very significant power of the British in India. Right? So, that's why this event is little important and to be remembered. Bombay, Madras, Calcutta. Yes, perfect. Okay. So, the last one is golden form and issued to the British by Sultan of Golconda. See, this is little vague here. It should have been British here. Okay. So... Golden Farman issued to the British by the Sultan of Golconda. So, this is in the year 1632. This is important because from here only British invention became, I mean intervention became very severe in the Bahamani kingdom. Okay, after the Bahamani's decades come in now. So, Sultan of Golconda becomes a, you know, party with the British after this farman okay so after this event only the nizam rule as well as the sultan's rule in, in in down south becomes very very prominent okay so till then the british didn't have much of opportunity here yet okay so this is one landmark event okay so now looking at this if you have to arrange it should be one three two okay next one in the Battle of Santom, French forces defeated the British army in India on the banks of River Adyar. And then in Battle of Vandivash, French lost Jinji and Mahe to British. So, which wars they are talking about? Any idea? It's the rivalry between which two European powers? Perfect. So, which wars they are talking about? Carnatic wars. Okay. They are talking about the Carnatic wars. Okay, now, so British versus French. So, in Battle of Santom, French forces defeated the British army in India on the banks of River Adyar. They are talking about First Carnatic War. Okay, 1940, sorry, 1746 to 49 times. Okay, they are talking about the First Carnatic War. Of the First Carnatic War, the Battle of Santom or Battle of Adyar, it's also known as Battle of Adyar, is very important because this is the battle that decides or that shows that the French is having an upper hand in the Carnatic Wars. Okay. So, actually, what is the position of British and French in the Carnatic Wars? French is having an upper hand. French is more powerful because of due place policies. Right or not? So, French is doing really good. But then what happens? In Battle of Vendée Wars, French will lose it because due play will be called back after the second Carnatic War. Okay. So, due play will be called back by his home government. French government will recall him. So, after the recall, there will be Count de Lally, again as the Viceroy, I mean as the, you know, Viceroy of the French here, who will not work very efficiently, therefore, French loses, okay. So, this is in the year 1760, Battle of Wandiwash, okay. So, 1760, Wandiwash happens and again in Chennai, present day Vandavasi it is, okay. So, French loses Jinji and Mahe. Jinji again is in present day Senji. Okay, so present day Senji, it's also called as Jinji Senji Fort. There's a fort there. Okay, it's near Kadalur. Present day. 
present day. This is in our Kerala. Mahe. Okay. So, both statements are true. Correct. Then, which of the following reasons can be attributed to the success of British in colonizing India against other European countries? A little, you know, analytical question. Right? So, firstly, English Navy was superior compared to other European powers. Is it so? True. Their Navy was powerful. English held three important places, namely Calcutta, Bombay and Madras. True again. See, three important places. Why do they call this to be important? Because coast. Okay. And this is an hinterland. Okay. Also again coast. Okay. So, this becomes a little important. Correct. Then, British neglected their commercial interests and upheld imperialistic motives. Yeah, one thing is, they did not neglect their commercial interests. This is true. Okay, I mean, this is false. So, we know this is false. And then, upheld imperialistic motives. So, imperialistic motives, yes or no? Partially true. So, now in such cases, what do you do? You accept or reject the statement? Reject the statement. See, first of all, in UPAC, you know, you will not have these, you know, ambiguities. But this is also false in a way. Okay. So, which period they are talking about? They are talking about reasons that can be attributed to success of British in colonizing India against other European countries. So, they are talking about the 1600 to 1760 times. Okay, now, at this point of time, they did not have much of imperialistic motives. What is imperialistic? Uh, uh, not really territory building. It could also be like, you know, you're, you're, you're establishing your power, influencing your power over a smaller, you know, uh, uh, you know, lesser influenced people. Okay, so now imperialist means you're becoming more dominant, you're ruling over. Okay, you're assuming power and you are you know you are you are you are imposing that power on somebody else that's what it means by imperialistic motives okay so now when it is that at this point of time not true okay it was not true so this statement is wrong okay so and again if they were having this opinion no they wouldn't have been able to you know establish their stronghold with the indian rulers also okay so it wouldn't have been possible Okay, so that's that way you can clearly eliminate this cause. Got it? Yes. So it should be one and two only. B. Done. Moving ahead. The principal settlement. Okay, there. We are talking about one of the foreign powers here. Okay. So their principal settlement was in Calcutta. Okay. Then they sold their factories to the British government in India. Okay, that means what? They came before British. Then they are better known for their missionary activities than for their commerce. Okay, and then the above paragraph best describes about which of the following countries. So, Portuguese. What do we know about Portuguese? We know that their important settlement is not Calcutta. Dutch. Why? Okay, and Dutch never sold much of its factories as such. They were still fighting. Okay, and also if you see the Dutch, you know, operations in India, no, they were mostly like, you know, on the transit mode. What do I mean when I say transit? They were just halting here to shift somewhere else. Ashtai. Okay, they were not wanting to establish themselves here because, you know, they had Indonesia. They were very much interested in Sri Lanka and Indonesia, mostly. Okay, with Battle of Badera, they'll be thrown out. Okay, so that's again, no. So now only thing that's left is our Danes, Danish people and then our French. Okay, so French missionary activities we did have but not much. Okay, and then they sold their factories, never. Okay, so no, they didn't sell. So it is our Danes. And Danes, why I gave this question very importantly is that they are very much known for their missionary activities. The moment we say missionary, we talk only about the French missionaries and the British missionaries. But Danes have established very good missionary activities in India. Okay? Clear? 
right so that's about our danes perfect okay so moving ahead which of the mughal kings introduced the izara system what is izara system okay so this was introduced by our jahandar shah okay so it is in the same order bahadur shah the first jahandar shah for rukhsia 1717 and then 1948 onwards this guy comes in mohammad shah okay so izara system is nothing but a system where they improve the revenue collection systems okay so they bring in more measurement of the land and then they charge taxations okay so this was introduced by our jahandar shah it's a fact that we have to remember okay see later mughal jali you have like say almost around some 18 to 20 mughal kings okay under each one of them there are certain important things that you will have to remember okay and they are very much facts especially in kpsc level they very you know regularly ask these areas okay so please make sure that you remember them factual uh, contributions then consider the following statements nadir shah defeated nadir shah defeated mughals in the battle of karnal in 1739 okay yes okay and then ahmed shah was the mughal emperor during the battle of karnal 1739 who was the mughal king then perfect okay so this was our muhammad shah okay so this is true because we have to remember this alwa but do we know is it called as battle of karnal we do not know okay we have not discussed much of this okay battle of karnal we don't know but then you know when we clearly know that mughals were defeated and nadir shah invaded india this can be true okay and then see in cases where you do not know answers at all and still you have to you know mark answers no these are the hints okay so you have to take risks at some point no you have to take in some areas okay and then it was mohammed shah okay 1739 so it is our mohammed shah who comes from 1738 onwards I believe okay so it is our mohammed shah not 17 28 17 yeah, 28, 17, 28 onwards, he'll be there. Okay, because he'll de be there for 38, 48, 49. Um, 40, yeah, he is still 17, 48, that I'm sure of. But um, yeah, it is 28 only. 17, 28 to 48 or 49 around. Okay, he'll be there for a long period because he's the only later Mughal king who is there for a very long period after our Aurangzeb and who's also little, who also had an opportunity to revive the Mughal glory, but he will lose it because of his... Uh, you know, wises. Yeah, perfect. So, correct statement, one only, right? So, option A. Moving ahead. So, economic condition of India during the 18th century. So, first statement says agriculture was backward. Second one says exports were more than imports. Okay. And then the third one says industrial and agricultural products of india were in good demand in foreign markets okay so, fine see actually see first of all when they came in no they wanted to introduce more of you know small level industrial goods consumer goods where they didn't pay much of attention towards agriculture and agriculture was also largely impacted because of one thing is there was no enough capital invested into the agriculture and whatever revenue generation was happening with agriculture you no know, they also did not reinvest it into it they wanted to divert the capital from agriculture to some other industry. So that eventually made agriculture backward. Okay, fine. And then exports were more than imports. See, ideally, if exports are more than imports, what is the uh, you know, condition? We are, we are beneficial. Okay, it's beneficial for us. But here, because they were exporting it to their home country with zero cost, it was like, you know, drain, you know, drain of wealth. Otherwise, this is a positive situation only. Despite this, we were not doing good. Okay, so exports were definitely more than imports. Okay, and then industrial and agricultural products of India were in good demand in foreign markets. Certainly, yes, that's why the merchants all over the country, I mean, all over the world got attracted to India. Right or not? Because we became a, you know, supplier. Right? Therefore, this is also good. Our products were in very good demand in foreign markets. Therefore, it is D. One, two, three. Okay. 